Hello and welcome back to another episode of If You Want To Do What. Today we've got Kat Yoram and she is an electrical engineer. Hiya. Hi everyone. Thank you so much for having me today. Our pleasure. Really looking forward to chatting about this one, geeking out a bit about space and electrical engineering. <laughs> Same. <laughs> so do you want to tell everyone a bit about it? Sure. So I grew up in just... I remember being completely obsessed with space. I was definitely that kid that would get in trouble for staying outside for way too late, uh, but for very different reasons. I remember I would bring out pieces of paper and I would try to map out the stars. I just really wanted to know what the scientists a long time ago were seeing and how they were able to look at the stars and know, well, this is a planet this is a moon, this is a star. And I wanted to figure that out for myself. I wanted to feel like I was one of them or could one day be like them. Um, And as I grew older, this also transitioned onto technology. I've always had a lot of questions. I figured out, you know, about a lot of lies my parents were telling me as a child just by (laughs) asking my mom a bunch of questions until she finally cracked and was like okay (laughs) fine fine this is the truth about Santa Claus you got me you happy now (laughs) (laughs) Um, and so that's just sort of the mindset I've had all my Mm. life where I have had questions and I just keep going until I find the answer so for technology, that's basically what it was. I looked at something like a TV or a computer and I needed to know how it worked, but also I wanted to know how I could do that myself. I love that. I think that's such a, a common feeling for, for for those of us who that are, are into science or into space or, or whatever it be when you're looking up at the stars and you're thinking, wow, you know, what is that? How, you know, uh, just the whole concept of space and time and, and all of that is, is quite mind blowing, isn't it? So it must be an incredibly uh, interesting field to be in. Yes. And just the fact of knowing that the work that you're putting in is helping us get more answers mm. is just so amazing. So for anyone that doesn't actually know what it is, what is electrical engineering? Sure. So electrical engineering is defined find differently across different countries. And this is something that I found out by having a public presence online where I was realizing that a lot of people were confused about the title, but at least in the United States, which is where I studied electrical engineering, we study a whole different range of things. So it could go from electronics um, to power, um, all the way to some material science and all of that combined to either create for example, the things that you see like computers, TVs. Um, So particularly for me, I focused on electronics. So what that means for me is that I work on creating those beautiful, beautiful green boards that you see inside of your electronics (laughs) when you might either break it on purpose or break it accidentally. (laughs) That's what I chose to focus on. But electrical engineers can work on a lot of different things, such as, for example, um, the microchips, anything as little as a microchip to um, as big as the power in a whole spacecraft. And I'm right in saying you're applying your electrical engineering to the space industry, right? Yes. I'm currently working in the space industry, but on the robotics, I mean, on the um, electronics side of things for robotic missions. That is unbelievably cool. Um, So how did you sort of get into that world? So you went and studied at university and then how did you actually get into the industry you're in now? Yeah, I actually have always wanted to get into this industry. I grew up watching those, you know, the Nova documentaries about the amazing missions to space like Voyager Mm. and the rovers. And I just was so fascinated. But at the same time, it felt like a whole other world. It felt like something that was reserved for the perfect genius um you know a man wearing the white button up with the little pens in the pocket that's the that's the image that I had of the people who got to work on something like that Mm. so although I've always been really interested and it's something that I spent a lot of time on learning about these missions where they were going 
um, what they were doing. And I knew I was going to work towards it. At the same time, it still sort of felt like a far, a very, very far away dream. I eventually got to college. So I went to UCLA, University of California, Los Angeles, and I studied electrical engineering there. While I was there, I was able to join a research lab, which was a robotics lab. They specialized in little robots. They wanted essentially to create kind of like recipes for creating these robots. So they were working on a computer program where essentially you could give it what features you wanted for your robot. And this oh, wow. program would sort of spit out the instructions of this is what you need. This is how you can build it. Um, and that's kind of when I first got some experience into, okay, well, in order to work on robots and robotic uh, projects, I don't actually have to be a robotics engineer. There's so many different things that you need, like computer science and electricity. I mean, you need electricity for all of these things. So that's when I started to realize that it's not as black and white as wanting to be in the space industry and needing to be an aerospace engineer, which I feel like a lot of people think that, but that is not true at all. All sorts of fields are necessary for the space industry. Mm. And so I decided, okay, I'm going to give it everything I have and I'm going to apply. So I ended up applying uh, to the Jet Propulsion Lab, which is in Pasadena, California. And wow. lucky for me, UCLA is about 45 minutes on a bad day of a drive away. <laughs> <laughs> this is LA. So those bad days are pretty much every day. <laughs> um, so uh, gosh, it took so long for me to hear back. I had honestly given up. I think I applied like October, November timeframe. And then I didn't hear back until the following year in. Oh my God. End of February or beginning of March. Wow. So I already had other offers lined up. Um, wow. I was actually going to do an internship with the U.S. Air Force. Oh, wow. And yeah, so, you know, I, I was doing my thing. I kind of had you know, just forgotten about that. And as soon as I got the call for the interview, I just prepared, like I've never prepared for anything <laughs> in my life. I looked up the person because he told me his name, who was going to interview me. And I read his whole, anything I could find about him, everything, all the projects he'd been working on, the missions he'd been on. And I wrote down questions for him about when you were on this mission, working on mm. blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you knew I gave it my all. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I made it my job to know this person um, and it ended up going really well. And this is a story that I really love to tell because I think that a lot of us see opportunities as kind of just clear cut, right? It's either I get mm. it or I don't. But this one was very, very special because this internship which was for my dream place to be, you know, NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab, they were looking for an intern um, in computer science. And I'm an electrical engineer. Mm. I do know how to program. I've taken classes. But one, it's not what I wanted to do for my career. Uh, and two, I was not very good at it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, I said, OK, I'm going to prepare myself as much as I can. It's a foot in the door and let's just see where this can take me. Well, I was 100 percent sure I did not get the position because mm. at the end, after having a really amazing conversation with this interviewer, which, you know, as we should, because I knew his whole life, <laughs> <laughs> Um, he tells me that he really wanted me to know that I definitely belong at a place like JPL and that he didn't want me to give up, that there are other positions and other groups always looking so to keep applying. So oh, when nice. I heard those words, oh, I was nice. like, oh, no. OK, thanks. <laughs> I get it, though. This is yeah. you very gently rejecting me. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Um, and so that was that I didn't really feel too bad because I took his word seriously. You know, even though I knew I had gotten rejected for this, I knew that he meant what he had told me, 
because mm. one, that position really wasn't for me. It was not my experience. And, you know, when you're hiring someone for a particular job, obviously you want the person that's going to do the best job. And I understood that that wasn't me in that moment. However, he understood my passion for the lab. And I know that what he said, he didn't just say that to everybody. And mm. a couple of weeks later, I get a call from him, which I was very shocked about. Mm. Um, I remember that I was taking a nap and he called me. So I was really out of it. <laughs> and I kind of just didn't even understand what was going on. Um, you know, like when you wake up from a nap and you don't even know what, you yeah, know, you don't even know what day it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're like, wait, am I? Oh, I'm 25 today. Like, OK. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so he tells me that they want to offer me a position. And I remember I was speechless. I didn't say anything because I was just. I still have thinking I was dreaming. I had no mm. idea what was going on. Um, and then I remember he said, is that okay? And I was just like, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course it's Lying, okay. Yeah. Um, but what, what is it for? Because I knew I hadn't gotten the other one. Mm. And that's when he told me that they decided to open up a new position, specifically in electronics, which is what my experience was in. And wow. that I was going to be working alongside the other person who got the job for the computer science internship. Now, fast forward uh, a few years, well, a couple years, and I finally got the guts to ask my mentor what the heck had happened. And that's when he told me that this engineer had loved my interviews so much that he came back to the people offering the internship and asked them whether they would be willing to open up a position in what my experience was, handed them my resume. Um, and basically, they said, sure, let's do it. And they opened up a position just for me. That's incredible. Um, I, mean, I love that story because that is exactly what we kind of talk about doing on the podcast. You know, not only did you apply and go for the opportunity in the first place, but you didn't just wait for the interview and then, and then try and do your best. You know, you did all this research and you really made it count. Uh, and it ended up with them creating essentially a job for you. So that's that's incredible. Yeah, yes. And I mean, after that, it kept going. I said, I'm here now. I'm going to make the best of it. I talked mm. to everybody that I could, which is really hard for me because um, I'm actually really introverted and I grew up with a lot of social anxiety. Mm. But when something as important as what I've wanted all my life is on the line, I just, you know, get all the courage and do what I need to do, which That's is what amazing. I did. Really cool. I, I talked to us. Yeah, yeah. It, it kind of just takes over you, you know? <laughs> yeah. So I talked to as many people as I could. I went to as many engineers as I could doing work that I was interested in. I told them that I would be uh, willing to take up whatever spare little projects they don't have the time for. And they actually were giving me these projects. So what ended up happening is that I started getting really booked for two reasons. One, I was doing the job that the current engineers didn't have the time for. So if I didn't do it, an engineer would have to. And two, I'm an intern, so I'm very, very cheap. <laughs> so it's a great deal for them. Yeah. And I kept getting work. I just kept getting more and more. And they kept extending my internship until finally my supervisor says, you know what? I'm getting real tired of doing all this PIP work. We're going to hire <laughs> you as a student. Um, your internship will no longer end until your graduation. And that's wow. when we'll evaluate everything and we'll see where that goes That's so incredible. I just stayed I didn't have to interview ever again um I've been there full-time for two years I believe a little bit over two years now and uh still doing my thing <laughs> that is amazing what a great story and it just shows you like perseverance working hard just constantly asking like you said going around to the engineers asking them can I do anything more you know you really really put yourself out there and, and it's paid off in the end so you know, amazing well done for doing that yeah thank you it's been a lot of fun I've been able to work on some really cool things especially back when I was a student I mean mm. as a student I think one of the coolest things about the lab is that you were working on real stuff mm. like my very first project that I did I was able to see it be used to test a computer for a spacecraft in a thermal vacuum chamber. So they were using this little board that I designed 
in uh, along with the actual computer that was going to go in the spacecraft and the thermal vacuum chamber essentially is where giving it the different ranges of temperatures that it's going to experience out in space as a full-time engineer to see my little board that I made was just my very very first project as a student and it's just it's so cool to know that your work as a student is valued equally mm. um another really I was able to work on was I was actually able to work on the Perseverance rover. Um, okay. I was able to work on a, basically they have for the robotic arm testing, they have this system, which is what they use in order to stimulate the arm. So to move it around, um, mm-hmm. it's essentially the brain for the arm, since we have to test everything individually first before assembling so it, you know this arm doesn't have access to what's actually going to tell it what to do eventually so okay, we have to so design our own it. got you yeah um and they realized that they needed a something more like this this system wasn't really performing to the required specifications the arm sensors are extremely sensitive Mm -hmm. and so for the really 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 small signals they weren't getting very good readings so they needed a board that was essentially an amplifier filter um and my mentor and i were assigned this kind of emergency board because the testing was coming up really quick we had very little time to get it done and I remember once we finally did after a bunch of prototyping a lot of staying up trying to figure this out we delivered it we hand delivered this board that we worked so hard on to the lab where the arm was mounted up about to be tested and it's like meters away from my face and I'm just looking at this robotic arm that's going to be in Mars soon that's currently in Mars now wow and that image of like walking in and that's what you see I it's it's engraved in my mind it's amazing incredibly cool um um, if somebody's listening to this and thinking you know I really would love to be doing something like that or applying this skill set to to a different industry what are the top three skills you'd recommend that they really work on um, to make themselves very, very employable? Yes. And I think this goes back to what I had mentioned, where you don't have to be an aerospace engineer in order to work in the space industry. So this is something that's pretty common misconception. And I get this question a lot from people telling me, I really want to work in space. I'm an electrical engineer or I'm a material science engineer, um, or, you know, something that's not aerospace. And they'll say, but I don't have any space experience. So that's why I haven't applied. But no, I mean, I had no space experience at all either. What really matters is that you have enough experience in your own little bubble. So for example, for me, I'm an electrical engineer. I had plenty of experience with electrical engineering. I had plenty of experience with a board design with all of the softwares necessary with pretty much what it entails to design a board and bring it out, test it, all of that. And that's what was really important because the space applications can be taught to you and the requirements will be told to you once you're already working. So that's not necessarily something you need experience in. Rather, you need to make sure that you really focus on your specific Um, skills, like your specific area of expertise. So the things that I recommend is one, really narrow down what it is that you're interested in within your field. Um, Two, figure out what it is that is being used professionally. What was able to eventually get me in the door at a lot of different places is that as a student, I was already very well versed in the professional softwares that are being used in industry. These softwares have a really, really steep learning curve. And usually when you're a student, since, um, you know, you don't really necessarily have the time for all of that, you'll kind of just use whatever the free versions are or the smaller versions that are not as detailed. But that is not enough because once you're actually in industry, you are going to need very deep knowledge of the professional software. So that's something that was really, really able to to get me in the door. And that's another reason I was able to get that position open for me because in my resume was these professional software. So they knew that if they brought me on, they weren't going to have to spend, you know, 
five weeks teaching me this software and then the other five weeks for the project. I could come in and get started right away. Right. So really that's point. another thing. It's really important to know that. Um, and lastly, I think just the excitement to really show that excitement and the passion for what you want to do. I have a quick story. So I was uh, able to hire interns for a project that a group and I proposed. Mm -hmm. And we actually decided to go with the student that although he had less experience in a lower GPA, he said that growing up, he would drive by JPL. He would try to find the places where he could get a good look. He would look up all the documentaries he could. He would read all the stories about the missions, what we were up to. And versus the other student who had a really high GPA, had enough experience as a student where he could have gotten a full-time job anywhere with mm -hmm. that resume. But he sounded really bored. It kind of just sounded like this was just any other interview to him. It didn't really sound like he was too excited about our work. I remember he said, um, yeah, I want to I want to try and look into the space industry and see if maybe this is something I could do for 40 years of my life. And we were like, mm, mm. No, that's not that that's not the person you want, <laughs> is it? Yeah. So that's something that you really need to convey. It's so important. I mean, especially when the people who are interviewing you are so passionate about this, as yeah. you can probably hear in my yeah. voice right now, yeah, I just cool. get so into it, you know? And so you want someone that matches your energy. So make sure to really convey that. That's it. And for you, what would be the number one biggest positive of working in this industry? You know what? I think that it is just the fact that everybody loves the mission yeah, and the so goal cool. yeah, and there's no competition. There's never any competition between us. If mm -hmm. I have a question, I can go up to anybody, the highest level engineer and ask them a question and they'll take 20 minutes out of their day. If we're in lab, you know, take out their whiteboard and explain everything. It's just, it's kind of like you're in a place where everyone could be your professor if you just ask. Wow. Very cool. So it's amazing. And on the flip side of that, then what's um, something that's sort of less favorable about working in the industry? Um, I think I would say that since we are government funded, it can be a little bit unstable sometimes mm -hmm. um, as the different government groups cycle through sometimes some missions are lost so sometimes certain politicians will back certain missions and once those politicians are either voted out or leave office and they're no longer backing it then nobody else really is backing it so it kind of just takes a back seat so there's some uncertainty that goes on um that probably wouldn't happen in the private industry sector mm -hmm. so it's just hurdles that we have to jump through um but it is what it is it, it it makes sense because we are operating with tax dollars sure and what would you say something that is not in your job description but yet you have to deal with on a daily basis Ooh, <laughs> <laughs> i would say um mentorship okay it's a good one yeah so I have a lot of students who will reach out to me partly because of who I am, right? I mm, mean, yeah, for yeah. a lot of a lot of minority students might not feel necessarily as comfortable asking certain questions to possibly their mentors or other older male engineers. So I have a lot of younger female students who reach out to me who are not necessarily in my group, but will reach out and ask if, you know, we can meet up and kind of just talk about some things. And a lot of it also has to do with um, just being a woman in the industry. We definitely have a different experience. Yeah. And having somebody that they can talk to and ask these questions to and ask, hey, somebody said this to me. Should I ignore it? Should I, what should I respond? Should I report that? What, what would you do? Uh, it's really important because statistically women are leaving technology fields at very high rates. And the reasons that they're citing is toxic work environments. It's not that they can't do the job. It's not that they are not 
good at their job, it's that they don't feel welcome and mm. they're being constantly attacked. So it's not something that I thought I would have to do coming in. That's not why I chose this. It's not, I didn't decide to be an engineer as a woman because I wanted to be a role model, but I have realized, I realized very early on that I have a, a lot of responsibility in that area. It's amazing that you're you're doing that and you're able to sort of, you know, shed a light on that. And that's, um you know, that's obviously something that's, uh, you're having a positive impact on other people, which is amazing. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, I think one of the most important things to me is when I'm able to get those messages from young women who say, mm. I was about to quit. I had already written my letter or I had already looked up what else I could possibly do. And then you popped up and I decided to go on for a little while longer and that is just everything to me because I know the reasons why they want to leave. I was there too. I mean, I, I've had multiple times where I have genuinely considered just trying to figure out what else I could possibly do. Wow. Um, one, because yes, it's extremely, extremely difficult. And when you don't have um, a support system for one, which a lot of women don't have and a lot of minority groups don't have. And two, when you don't have a, the economic background where you can just focus on your studies, right? So a lot of us, unfortunately, have to pay for our, our things. We have to pay yeah. for our tuition. We have to pay yeah. for our books. We have to pay for all that. And um, although my parents were were very supportive of what I was doing. Unfortunately, the money just wasn't there. So I really just had to figure it out the whole way through, held multiple jobs here and there, sometimes two or three or whatever I could find. And it gets overwhelming. You definitely hit that point where you're just like, I can't do this anymore. Well, you're you're obviously doing an amazing job now and and, and flying and you you know, I mean working where you work is incredible. And you know, how many people that that loves space and science would would absolutely bite your bite your hand off to be doing what you're doing so um amazing but for you you know thinking about this industry and people starting to look at what they want to do and going forward i guess this industry and not only government funded but privately as well is going to really really rapidly grow in the coming years yes oh yeah i mean even just in this past couple of years there's so many new space companies so space companies have existed for a while I remember when I was in college and these some of these bigger companies like Blue Origin you weren't really hearing about any of them um, they existed but I kind of feel like they weren't really taken seriously they weren't really given any bigger contracts um the only ones that I could think of that were were like Lockheed Martin some of them already established companies mm-hmm. Um, But now I'm seeing such a big growth and so many different companies are popping up and competing for some of these contracts. And it's just so cool. I was thinking the other day about how we're kind of living in the moment, right? We don't really think about how much we, we've, how far we've come when it comes to technology, because it's like, oh, the iPhone 10, the iPhone 11, the iPhone 12. <laughs> but how about we compare this iPhone 12 to like the iPhone 3G that I had yes. in middle school, you yeah. know, like we couldn't <laughs> even put a background on it. Yeah, <laughs> crazy. Yeah, no, it is mad how how far tech's come. I think for me, when I really started to pay attention to all these different space companies is when I saw the first um, boosters reverse land i don't know if that's the right term oh, space from spacex yeah. like my yeah. mind was literally blown <laughs> it, it doesn't look real when you first see it you think no that that's just the footage is being played in reverse but it's it's amazing yeah it's really cool and i i like how it's kind of become the norm now like any company yeah. that tries to uh do that now it's like you have to you know otherwise like oh they couldn't land <laughs> 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 exactly and I, I guess we, we always like to finish on this question so would you still go into this industry knowing everything you know now a hundred percent and actually I'm really grateful for what I've gone through because mm. it, I mean you know there's so many things that I 
could change if I if I were to go back, but I don't want to because it's led me here and it's also led me to be in a position where I can help other people because I know what they're going through and I can truly truly empathize so I'm just so grateful number one to myself for pushing through for having that strength yeah and I really just want to use that to help as many people as I can who maybe didn't have my situation where um, at least for me So I had my mom and my mom has always been my biggest supporter. And the two times that I said I was going to quit, my mom was, um, you know, she's a very traditional Mexican mom. (laughs) And so the first time that I told her, she was just like, you're so dumb. What is wrong with you? Go, go to your room, finish your homework. (laughs) If you don't finish your homework right now, you're going to get behind. You're not dropping anything. Go. (laughs) So I went, I finished my homework and I didn't drop anything. (laughs) But unfortunately, there's a lot of people who don't have that, who whose parents are not supportive, whose parents don't even think they should be doing this to begin with. Mm. And that's what I want to be. I want to be kind of like that big sister, that friend that they yeah. don't have. I'm just so grateful for my journey, for bringing me to the point where I can do that. Well, thank you so much for, for, you know, taking the time to come and chat to us. I mean, your job is incredibly cool and I, I wish you the best of luck on all your future projects. And um, yeah, thank you again for taking the time. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. And where can people find you on social media? Because you've got some really good, good stuff and good content up there. Yeah, thanks. So you can find me on Instagram and on TikTok as well as Twitter with the same handle, which is Cat Voltage. So K A T, and then the word Voltage all together. Amazing. Thank you again. Thank you so much.